Uh, I think the world would be a better place if there was a lot more public reading of poetry. So I'm going to start with some poetry. This is A Blade of Grass by Brian Patton. You ask for a poem. I offer you a blade of grass. You say it is not good enough. You ask for a poem. I say this blade of grass will do. It has dressed itself in frost. It is more immediate than any image of my making. You say it is not a poem. It is a blade of grass, and grass is not quite good enough. I offer you a blade of grass. You are indignant. You say it is too easy to offer grass. It is absurd. Anyone can offer a blade of grass. You ask for a poem. And so I write you a tragedy about how a blade of grass becomes more and more difficult to offer. And about how, as you grow older, a blade of grass becomes more difficult to accept. I felt a little daunted at the prospect of talking about wonder. I mean, after all, by definition, it, it seems to be a concept that is bigger than me, too large for me to get my arms around. But then I began to think of wonder more as a mindset, as an attitude to life, as an approach to living. So I'm going to start by offering some personal interpretations, uh, not dictionary definitions. Wonder and awe are not the same thing. The writer Terry Tempest Williams says that awe is the moment when ego surrenders to wonder. Awe is that experience when we become tiny in the face of this existential immensity, when we are more than humbled, when we become obliterated, tiny in the face of this infinite universe. Wonder I like to think of as surprise, blended, mixed in with admiration. So if we're going to follow Terry Tempest Williams' formula, wonder is the key to the door beyond which lies awe. And ego is that door and is either open or it's closed. So ego is that barrier and I'm wondering, how does that show up in our lives? How, how are we going to surrender it? Ego perhaps shows up as arrogance, as a certain sort of self-righteous certainty. And goodness only knows, I've been guilty of a degree of self-righteous know-it-allness. Ego perhaps shows up as indifference, an indifference to life, an apathy towards living, an absence of curiosity. Ego maybe manifests itself as false certainty, a kind of fake it till you make it attitude. And that's understandable, right? Um, no one wants to be the person that doesn't know something. We live in a world where knowing things is valued. I don't know about you, but, but I have on occasion been paid to have answers, not paid to be questioning. And maybe this reveals something a little deeper about ego. And it's fear, fear of embarrassment. No one wants to be the person that puts their hand up to say, I don't know. I don't understand. I, I'm, I'm ignorant of this. Ego can stupefy us. We can be dulled in the face of modern pressures to conform, to appear certain and knowing, assured, to obey social norms, to not rock the boat. In short, I guess our sense of self can be fragile at times and we will avoid unsettling it. But the price of that is an absence of awe. If, if we're going to experience this life-affirming joy that can come with awe, we are going to have to explore the unexpected, the absurd, the unknown. And so we're going to have to wonder. So I think in that regard, I, I'll offer you the same advice that poet Rainer Maria Rilke offered to a young man that ask for his counsel. And Rilke had this to say. So Rilke said in letters to a young poet, 
try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books written in a foreign language. Do not now look for the answers. They cannot now be given to you because you could not live them. It is a question of experiencing everything. At present, you need to live the question. So I can't tell you about the source of this, but Albert Einstein is reputed to have said, if you give me an hour to solve a problem, I'll spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem, five minutes thinking about the solution. So wonder is an active, intentional practice. And I think that wonder is located and emanates from within us. And I also believe that wonder is to be practiced in the world, the world around us, and especially with the people around us. Because I believe that ordinary people are possessed of extraordinary stories. So a few years ago, I uh, traveled around Nebraska as part of a project called A Couple of 830 Mile Long Conversations. And I traveled to small towns with the intention of meeting people, purely for that sake, to talk with them. And among the cast of characters I met were people like Butch in Neely. And I chatted with Butch for a little while, and at one point I asked Butch, what do you want in a community that you live in? And Butch said, well, get rid of the damn Mexicans for one thing, which I'll admit wasn't the response I was hoping for. But we talked for a bit longer, and then Butch shared this fond friendship he developed with a Latina, a woman named Maria, and how this friendship had flourished and how sad he was when one day she rapidly said, I, I have to leave and I'm going tomorrow because of immigration issues. There was Mark in Valentine and Mark shared with me that when Mark was 11, his father committed suicide. And we chatted a bit more and then Mark told me about how Mark's son at 16 had died and that Mark had spent his entire life making sense of these two deaths. I met Edison Rednest in Alliance, and Edison shared with me a story of a happy childhood that, that went off the rails, drug addiction, drug dealing, seven years in Tecumseh Prison. And then he emerged and founded a, a nonprofit whose mission was sharing positive stories and the rich cultural heritage of his native Ogallala Sioux people. But as he's telling me this story, and we spoke for two hours, at one point he just stopped and he said, I can feel my heart racing. I'm, I'm a bit short of breath and, and my, my palms are sweating, but I have to keep telling you this story about these traumas. And then also in Alliance, I met a lady called Elaine and she was someone who didn't believe she had anything to share. And so she said, I, I don't want to sit down and talk with you. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can talk about something. And she demurred and kept walking on. Until eventually, after a little more persuasion, she stopped and turned to me and said, well, do you want to hear my Charles Manson story? Of course I want to hear your Charles Manson story. <laughs> Wonder is a, it's an active, intentional practice. I believe it is a doing endeavor. I also firmly believe, and I was kind of pleased to see some of you have on your name tags, that part of what brings you wonder is that willingness to surrender your ego when confronted with the humans around you. And so I, I feel like wonder is not something to be talked about or to be talked at you. I think it's a, it's a doing thing. And you're a self-selecting audience. I mean, you've turned up. You, by being here, you've demonstrated an inclination into valuing questions, into valuing creativity into valuing each other. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking. And what I'm going to do is um, the gang over here are going to pass around some cards. And I think the important part of wonder is to activate it and activate it by exploring it with each other. So these cards are going to be passed out. And my invitation for you over the next five, 10 minutes is to take these cards Maybe pick a question, pick your own question, but I want you to find someone that you don't know, um, maybe two or three, depending on time, 
and see if you can surrender your ego and see if you can find wonder in a journey with someone else. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to invite you to take these cards, get up, find someone you don't know and explore what you can. Hands up if you found someone wonderful. Yeah. Hey, great. Who, who would like to say something wonderful about the person that they chatted with? Does anybody have something wonderful? You, you all met some wonderful people. Did you learn something wonderful? Tim, Tim learned something wonderful. Why have like a whole list of things? The first thing. Just one thing, Tim. Oh, okay. That'll, that'll give you the craziest thing. I want to hear the because list. Uh, yeah, I know, it is a long one. But I'll just give you the craziest one, because I walked up to her and I saw her name tag, and it says Alma on it. I said, I know an Alma. What kind of? I knew of an Alma. Back in the 80s. That's Alma. That's <laughs> <laughs> the same person. Wow. That's and crazy. Tell them why I chose you. She, oh, she, she chose me because this is her daughter, and she said, I do not want my daughter walking up to a guy like you, so she's going to meet that guy, and then I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> So that was kind That's of. That's not how it went. I, exactly I just. How it went. I just applaud your decision making, to be honest with you. In John's conversation, I won't give any particulars. But at the end of our wrap up, we figured out that if you're into this sort of thing, June is the solstice for summer. And so if you think about it, June is heavy. And a lot of things, a lot of decisions. Uh, very important, whether they be political, social, um, personal. We figured out that June is a heavy month for us, and we were wondering if it was because of the solstice. Sun, lunar, magnetism, all those things. So that was something that opened up a door to wonder mm. for me. Also, happy birthday. <laughs> okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, I guess I would just encourage you to surrender your ego, practice wonder, and hopefully find awe in your life. So thanks, everybody.